So, Alan, welcome to the stage. How are you doing today? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I've come into the office today, which is good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it does remind me of a lot of things that we've been doing together over the past three, four years, uh, and time has literally flown by. Good. Well, I'm going to hand over to you, and then I'll be back at the end to take any questions there are at that stage. So it's Brilliant. over to you, Alan. Thanks, Jonathan. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to be involved in, uh, you know, Be More Digital and specifically anything that Charity Digital puts together. Uh, I think we can all agree that they are by far and away the best charity focused events that uh, there are on offer today. So we're really proud, uh, proud and pleased to be involved uh, with the day. So um, I really wanted to, and Jonathan's kind of doing a little bit of a lead in there, but I really wanted to talk about how we can use data to manage better relationships and, and make better donor connections. So uh, I'm going to start a little uh, screen share quickly um, and then going to talk a little bit about, you know, our view and perspective, perspective on it. And then I think at the end, there's uh, there's an opportunity to network. And I'd really love to have that opportunity to discuss this more with you and understand a little bit more about how you guys see things and, and what role we as, as partners can play in that. So uh, without further ado, yeah, I'm going to just kick off um, and, and, and start the presentation. So a little bit about this, kind of always good to have our objectives up there. Fundamentally, the reason we like being involved in events like this is that it allows us to kind of generate debate, share our perspective, and hopefully through that de debate that we can, we can ge generate some change. And I think that the world is going through a lot of change, especially within the donor charity fundraising sector. And so, you know, we want to be part of that change, but that change is fundamentally based on us listening to what you need us to do. So we really want to be part of that. Um, so fundamentally, a little bit about just Trillium, and then we'll talk about the topic. Uh, we are a digital transformation provider for charities and not-for-profit organizations. Um, we're typically known as the CRM guys, but actually we do a lot more than that. We do a lot around digital engagement for everything from self-service to websites to email marketing automation solutions. Um, and really, we're, we're looking at it from more than just the, the technology perspective. We want to see how we can use technology to better change and enable your organization. So uh, we, know we, we use the technology, but it's really about how we can do that to support you using the technology. So what do we do? We do predominantly around CRM solutions. We have a whole digital capability, which is everything, as I said, from websites through to marketing automation. Uh, and then also looking at kind of how we can use you know, digital consultancy to help you plug those gaps uh, and provide some you know, strategic advice. Um, we are a tech provider, so it couldn't do this without uh, putting our, our technology partner logos on uh, the screen. So we do a lot around Microsoft Dynamics 365, uh, Embraco, a little bit around Sitecore. Dot Digital is our go-to email marketing platform, and they do a lot for the charity sector, so we like using them. And then we have some uh, payment solutions from Clear Direct Debit and Clear Accept uh, to help you transact online digitally uh, and take payments and donations for whatever you might be, be looking to do. So who do we do this for? I've just put up a sort of selection of clients. Um, you know, we tend to work with a broad selection of clients in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, and we'd love to, to discuss how we can do that more with yourselves, uh, if anyone's interested, or if there are any particular scenarios or case studies you wanted us to talk about, we'd be really happy to take a look at that. So enough about us. I really wanted to look at kind of exploring the importance of knowing your data and therefore being able to use your data effectively. And so understand the data that you have and how can it be used. So fundamentally, we think that the use, you know, use your data to make better interactions with your donors and stakeholders. And the best way to do that is to make it personal, relevant, timely and targeted. You know, so uh, I think that we're, we're in a strange situation where we have a lot of systems able to collect and store a lot of data. But what we're not seeing is a lot of intelligent use of that data. And so we really wanted to see if we could Demo, you know, demonstrate some key examples, uh, provide you with some tools towards the end, and then discuss where you are in terms of using data to make those more relevant, personal, timely, and targeted connections with your, your stakeholders. So most organizations will have two types of data about your stakeholders. They'll be either explicit or implicit. Explicit data is really about information that, you know, maybe donors give you. Uh, it could be everything from contact financial information. It could be demographics. A lot of the time it's preferences in terms of what they, how they want to be communicated with you, it might be about their relationship with you. And charities tend to actually store and hold lots of this data. 
And I think sometimes that also causes us all a lot of problems. So my view is if we're storing the data and we're prepared to manage the risk that comes with storing that data, we should have a really good reason for, make, for having that data and then a real implicit use for using it. So if we talk about implicit data, that's more about information that you can infer. So that's about behavior and context. It might still be anonymous, but you can still draw some conclusions about it. And so implicit data could be everything like Google Analytics through to uh, you summarizing ex implicit data in terms of what a behavior might be. So it could be about personalization on a page. It could be interaction with an email campaign. It could be any of those things. Uh, and implicit data is probably less easy to collect. It's definitely harder to draw conclusions from it. So uh, generally start with explicit data and then you can move into implicit data and, and those two should form a kind of symbiotic relationship in your, in your data strategy. So one of the things that we'd like to, to, to use today is to demonstrate one of the kind of more advanced mechanisms for, for capturing that kind of implicit data and can also be implicit as well, uh, is, is around engagement scoring. So first of all, what is engagement scoring? It's a value that will uh, define how engaged your supporters are. So these could be donors, they could be fundraisers, they could be volunteers, they could be stakeholders, they could be grant issuers, whoever they might be, anyone that you need to, to understand where your relationship is, engagement scoring will give you a numerical value that demonstrates where that relationship is. And then with that, you can do something. So uh, it could be a record of every interaction that you have with an individual supporter down to a contact level. And then each of these interactions is given an, a, an attribution score. Uh, and typically that's by type. So we would say for every email interaction, there's this many points for attending an event. There's this many points actually, you know, making a donation or for signing up to be a volunteer or even better if they're going to do one of the, 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 the volunteer events and they're going to generate some large donation value for us. We should have a way of demonstrating that their engagement is different and on different types of, act of, of, of activities. And then their actions correspond value accumulate and that results in an individual engagement score. So over time, more and more interaction, more, their, their scores will change. Uh, we can do things like decrease scores if they do things that you don't want them to necessarily do or if they fail to do things that you're hoping them to do. And really, it's important to recognize that it's a guide. It's not a, a, a hard and fast, you know, this person is more engaged than that person because they've got a higher score. But it should allow you to draw some deeper conclusions and drill into the data to say, why are they more engaged? What are we doing with that contact that makes them more or less engaged? And then tailor your communications and your approach to change that score, to move the needle into the direction that you need it to go. So why should you use engagement scoring? Well, I've got this annoying mentor that I'll always use uh, with the team here at Trillium. And it fundamentally is about if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. So we hear a lot about people talking about the fact that, you know, Digital engagement is the number one differentiator in terms of you know, customer experience, all of those things that are going to help us achieve our strategic goals. But very few people have a way of measuring that. So that's why we wanted to talk to you about engagement scoring and try and demystify what this topic is and how it can be better used uh, in, within your data strategy. So using engagement scoring will help you identify your most valuable supporters so that you can target them and work more with them. It will also help you identify uh, supporters that could add more value if you change the way you interact with them. It will allow you to identify disengaged supporters. So these are perhaps the people who your communications don't seem to be landing. Um, they do fit other criteria. That means that they're valuable to you and that you want to maintain and, and, and expand on that relationship. But for whatever reason, whatever you're doing isn't landing. So that's really important that you can identify those disengaged supporters and then come up with a different communication strategy to address why, you know, why they might be disengaged. And you can use these insights in a number of ways. You can actually play insights back to people and say, we can demonstrate the value that they represent back. It's always a great way of people realizing that you're listening and that they can that they are valued by you as an organization. It can help you improve your strategy to deliver better experiences. And it will also help you personalize your communications so that you can take control of those supporter relationships. And ultimately, what we want to do is to improve engagement. So uh, when should you use engagement scoring? Uh, you should absolutely use engagement scoring when you're prepared to do it. And so that fundamentally is underpinned by having a defined strategy. 
um, and being able to segment your data. So it's about knowing your data, being able to segment it and being able to draw conclusions from your data. Um, it'll be great if you start to want to, to move your engagement scoring to integrate with your personas. I'm sure any of you who've done some uh, new website uh, or customer journey mapping work will have recognized the value of personas. And so it'd be great if you could start integrating your personas into your engagement scoring. It's not essential, but it does demonstrate the best value as you move up the kind of value chain. Um, and you don't have, you have some form of technology to do the scoring. And so for those of you who don't have anything fancy in place, we've got some very basic Excel spreadsheets that you can use to kind of get going. Um, it does require some manual work and there are better ways of doing it, but we didn't want technology to be a defining, you know, limiting factor for you. When shouldn't you use engagement scoring? Well, fundamentally, if you don't have a strategy. And so, um, you know, it's it, it's fundamental to understand that uh, just having uh, engagement scoring could just be a technical solution. And just having some tech in place will not give you the outcome that you need if you don't have a strategy. And so having that strategy should be uh, there so that your engagement scoring can help you deliver on that strategy. So if you have some strategic objectives in terms of growing you know, online donations by a certain percentage, then your engagement scoring should align with delivering those strategic objectives. If you don't have clearly defined strategic objectives, you're just going to score and you're not going to know the value of the scoring. And I think that's probably worse than not doing anything at all. Um, and also you really need to have a basic understanding of your audience and what you want to know more about them and where you can, can use engagement scoring to identify gaps in your knowledge about them. So those are the two things I think I'd say as a, as a sort of foundation piece. So to help us kind of understand where everybody is on the call today, it'd be great if we could just pop up a quick poll and ask you a quick question. So if you've thought about engagement scoring or if you've looked at it and you've prevented it or you're not sure about it, could you just you know possibly answer, uh, we'll pop up the poll in a second and just answer any of these questions. What's limiting or preventing your use of engagement scoring? Is it a lack of defined engagement strategy? Is it about technology limitations? Is it a limited internal knowledge uh, of what you need to do? Uh, and is it just about time? There isn't ever enough time. We all know that. That's probably the biggest factor. Or is it about budget? Do you just not have the wherewithal to participate in these? So it looks like the poll never actually made it into this today. So what we'll do is we'll see if we can circle back to, to getting the poll up. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, and then maybe we can have that discussion towards the end. So hopefully we'll circle back to the poll. I think that could be quite useful to know uh, so we can do a bit more about understanding where you are in, in, in your journey. So what I wanted to do now is actually talk about a practical example. Uh, this is an example that we've, uh, that we've extracted actually from work with an existing client. Uh, and it's about understanding how data drives retention and recruitment uh, in, in what they call a kind of virtuous circle. So it starts off with engagement, and that can be an ongoing program around awareness for the services and benefits that you provide. Um, it could be around and then moving towards involvement and about how you can track engagement and score and play back that to demonstrate audience involvement uh, and their value. So as the involvement increases, you'll tend to get more advocacy. And so advocacy is where things become viral. People will, will, will talk more about it. Uh, they might be doing word of mouth. They might be talking about more, especially if they're doing a donation event. And so that's about really getting uh, volunteers to spread the word and to demonstrate um, their value to other stakeholders, donors through the process. And then the important one is this is where the engagement scoring coming. And that's really about being able to extract a return on investment and understanding which of your activities are generating the best engagement, not just financial return, but which of those activities are, are helping you do more if you improve engagement, the financial return should take care of itself. And then the critical one here is about retention. So minimizing cancellations, that could be cancellations of direct debits, et cetera, by using the data to play back to you stakeholders and remind them of everything that's happened before and how valuable the relationship is to you and hopefully the relationship is to them. And then if everything's worked in the, in the virtuous circle, that will self-perpetuate through more recruitment, more engagement, more involvement. And so we find this strategy quite interesting because it allows you to kind of quite systematically figure out where your, your donors or stakeholders are as they move through the process. So in terms of where this has worked quite well for one of our clients, 
uh, it's 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 about using the data to um, recruitment and retention strategy. So they 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 ensure that they could use data to inform that, and they constantly review and look at the data to figure out where they can can do better with certain relationships or personas. Um, it allows them the ability to proactively respond and target disengaged contacts before they might leave. So there will be some things that disengaged contacts tend to show evidence of, and so if you can identify those and you have those as a segment, you can quickly respond to that and see if you can do something about it. And really it's about the ability to identify and performing services as well. So if there are certain things that you're expecting to happen, and so let's say you launch a new you know, service or a way of, of, of engaging digitally, and it isn't delivering the value that you want, that's a good way of illustrating that either the communication or the actual service you're providing isn't going to generate the type of investment that you hoped it would. Uh, and it allows you to better reach and encourage taking your care of like ancillary services. So that's really where you might demonstrate that you could cross sell or possibly encourage deeper engagement through other services based on looking at other contacts who have the same scenario, same scores, but are also doing other things. You could draw some interesting conclusions from that. This particular client did a really good job at that. And really, it gave them the ability to create a 360 year view of all their contacts and their interaction with services, etc. And that really was transformed through their CRM. So everything we've spoken about now is kind of a strategy and stuff that you can do offline. But this was embedded into their CRM. So CRM becomes the single source of truth with capturing all that information, creating a central repository that they can use to guide all of their interactions. And so they have a lot of you know different communication channels, but all of that data homed back into CRM for reporting and making sure it's efficient. And really, it was able to improve accessibility and visibility of contacts through joining up uh, activities, whatever it might be through engagement. And really what we saw there was attrition was down by 26% measuring kind of 2019 versus a 12 year average. So this was, was work that we did with them completed over the course of the 2019 year. And they were able to look at that and say, actually we're 26% better at managing that attrition, which is their number one strategic objective. So we're going to provide these to you as a kind of uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, at, later on, but I just wanted to walk through what we think are the six steps to assigning scores to individual interactions. So number one, identify the activities that you want to score. So define your key supporter journeys. That's quite important. So if you've got, you know, uh, you know, sign up for a volunteer event, um, you know, make a donation, perhaps that might be. Uh, you know, submit uh, or an inquiry about establishing a legacy, whatever it might be, define those high level journeys and then define the activities that are important along each of those journeys. So if you've got five stages or three stages that are very important, assign scores through those stages and that will allow you to build up a score for an entire journey. So an example might be for a regular donation journey, there might be a campaign appeal. You might want to score that initially very low. You might click on an email. That needs also quite a low score. And if they reach the donation page, that gets a little bit more of a score but an actual donation should be a much higher score. And then you might want to go one step further and look at whether you would attribute uh, a, a, a deeper score for a regular versus a one-time donation. So within each journey, identify what your ideal outcome is. So set your target and give each ideal outcome a score. So in a sense, you almost want to work backwards. So if you look at that donation made and we say, right, we want to give that a score of 50, then you can work backwards to sort of build up a score as you get um, you know, uh, there. I would say that you need to have bigger steps, so bigger activities or bigger act uh, uh, in interactions that are worth more to you should be clearly defined by a much bigger leap in terms of the scores. So sense check your scores, and this is where you review all your out outcomes in the context of all the outcomes. So you'll look at you know, maybe one digital online donation journey, but then look at that score. So you may have attributed 50 points and the total journey would have accounted for 55 points. Uh, look at 55 points for an individual donation versus someone leaving a legacy. So if someone's leaving a legacy, uh, that probably should be a much higher score. That could be as high as 500. So it's important to create distance between your different scores uh, and just make sure that there is consistency and that you're not kind of creating a false economy by giving the wrong scores to the wrong activities. Um, and then look for engagement indicators. So looking at activities that happen before and after those key activities and try and figure out what are those activities that can make or break that journey. So if it's about you know, making a donation, well, fundamentally, they need to reach the donation page. They need to be part of the appeal. So in this case, it might be that the email 
is actually fundamentally important for making that journey happen. So just want to look out for those key indicators and make sure you've attacked them. And then one of the things that's really important here is to determine a retention period for that score. And this is where more of the advanced tools will help you. So um, if you've got a donor who's been with you for 20 years, they'll naturally accrue a larger score if you don't deprecate the score over time. So you want to make sure that you can do that uh, and be able to kind of attribute value where you need it. And so take frequency into account. And so as an example there, I would say that the actual donation needs to be valid for a year, but the actual email click isn't really of any value to you and in the true sense. So maybe you want to deprecate that over three months. And then finally, never forget to keep reviewing and adapting. Uh, be careful not to adapt your scores too often, but definitely look at the data, make sure that everything's proportional and look at it and kind of see, okay, regular journey versus a recurring journey. You know, does that stack up? Does, does it make sense when we compare those two things? So that brings me to the end of the kind of presentation piece. Um, what we are going to put up there now is a uh, link to a QR. Or we'll put it into chat as well. Uh, and there's a download there that you can just scan that QR code. And that will allow you to quickly download the Excel version of these in, in, in scoring sheets. Uh, and if anyone wants this deck for the guide piece, we can also send it out. Um, so really, that brings me to the, the end of me talking at you and really wanted to now engage with you. Thanks a lot, Alan. That was a really wonderful presentation. And apologies, everybody, that we got the poll live a little bit slow. I don't know if you want to go back quickly to the poll slide, Alan, if you want to give people a chance to fill that Good. in. Now you should see them on screen. So kind of what's limiting you in taking this before, you know, the step is it, you know, do you not have that strategy? Are there technology limitations? Um, have you just got a lack of internal knowledge or experience? Don't have time or don't have budget. So it'd be great if we could uh, could get your input on that. Especially if you've got the scores, they're not showing at the moment. I, I think we can we can we can extract the general the general feeling. Yeah. Uh, well, the highest was a fifty seven percent for answer C actually, um, which is quite interesting. So I can. So that's about limited knowledge or, or experience, and so hopefully we can hopefully we can share that with you today. Um, that was if I'm if I'm brutally honest, that was kind of the score I was hoping to see um, because it kind of validates the purpose of the talk. Um, so, uh, so yeah. I think there's some questions coming through. Uh, Duncan's got a great question. Do you use negative scores for actions which are not ideal? Um, there's a bit of a debate about this. I do think it's important to use negative scores, um, but only if they're fundamentally important to the ongoing relationship. Um, and so a negative score shouldn't be used unless it's a clear indicator of the fact that this relationship is going south. All right, so it needs to be quite a, a large kind of impactful event. Um, and I think that deprecating the scores, in other words, using a time period for having them valid for a period is a more effective way of ensuring that it isn't a case of person's been around for a long time and therefore they're getting a great score. There's a question which I shall answer in terms of the session being recorded. Yes, the session is being recorded. Um, we typically release all of those recordings about a week later. Uh, we, there's a bit of a delay because we burn all the closed captions into them before we release them so that they're fully accessible. Um, but you will therefore be able to share that with your full team once those are available and you'll automatically get notified of that because you subscribed for this event. Somebody else asked about the engagement scoring spreadsheet and uh, you've already said that that's done. So that's great. I'll just post well. that again into, into chat quickly. Still got a couple of minutes if anybody wants to add any other questions to this overall. Uh, so Duncan's replied and said, so something like a cancel DD, absolutely. That's a great illustration of quite a, a large indicator that something's not working. I would definitely say it's important to note the difference between a cancel direct debit and a rejected direct debit. In other words, they might have changed some of their bank account or something might have gone wrong. So uh, we have had scenarios where rejected bank account, uh, rejected uh, direct debits were used in scoring. And I don't think that's a great uh, negative use. I think that cancellation is a much clearer indication of there's something wrong in the relationship. Yeah. Could you expand on the use of personas, please? Um, yeah. So um, I, I liked it. 
you know, uh, for someone who's, who, 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 people who have or haven't done any sort of persona work uh, recently, I like to think that personas, you should, you should have a kind of named individual. Um, so, you know, I like to call them Frank and Bob and Jane and Mary. Um, and they're, they're typical contacts. So they, the, the exercise of doing a persona allows you to personalize and create some context around an individual rather than just treating people as scores. So you'll create a persona and it might be Bob, what, 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 who is Bob? What does he want from, from, from your charity? Is he a stakeholder? Is he a volunteer? Um, and what motivates him? And so that helps you identify key, key types of contacts that you need to, you need to focus on. So uh, we sometimes talk about tribes, which are a kind of a higher level of, of personas. So a great example with a tribe could be, are these people uh, advocates? Are these people uh, disillusioned? Are they involved? Are they engaged? And so those different uh, tribes could help you put people into buckets uh, that will help you manage it. So you can then attri attribute, attribute a score. Uh, if you have a score, you can attribute a persona or a tribe to somebody. So if someone's score is falling, we would typically say they're disengaged. Uh, if their score is increasing, we could say they're engaged. If they're participating in advocacy events, we might attribute a leader or an influencer uh, type tribe to somebody. And that just helps you kind of keep track and say, okay, we've got a problem here because we've got more people going year on year into the disillusion camp. What can we do about that? Yeah. An interesting question from Jason, which uh, I know plays right to your skill expertise. Are you able to share tips of how scores can be automated in a CRM? Um, yeah. So um, if you've got uh, something along the lines of, um, you know, if your CRM is, is keeping track of all those activities, so let's use the basic one, um, email marketing. So if your email marketing program, you know, solution is integrated like we do with Dot Digital, and it's integrated into the CRM, then you'll have a track record in one place of all of those interactions. And so we do the scoring inside the CRM. So anytime someone clicks, we attribute a score. If a person makes a donation, CRM automates that and attributes the score. So if you can get your, inter your, your engagement scoring integrated into your CRM, that whole solution can be automated. And that's what we did for that client where they used to spend a lot of time producing reports by correlating lots and lots of data. It's just real-time data that sits in their CRM now. So if you integrate those two, you'll get a, a, a much better output for what you're looking for. I think this is a last question for we'll have to wrap. Could you give an example of how you could use a negative score? Uh, so I think the negative, the, the best one's kind of cancellation of a DD. Um, I think one that definitely comes up is, is probably the one that's most annoying for everybody in the room who, who have kind of donor events, fundraising events, people who do not show um, for, for the event. I think that's a definite no-no. Um, other examples might be uh, if, you, if you really wanted to, you could use this as a negative score, in a, in, but a smaller one is if, if you have a repeat, an annual appeal and people are typically you know, responding to that annual appeal and you attribute a high score to it. And that annual appeal is really important to you and it's the core of what you do. So I'm thinking of UNICEF doing sort of stuff with the Paddington, you know, sort of stuff. I think that's a great example. If a person then cancels that, that should that could be quite a negative score in the sense that they're canceling your core campaign. They might still be engaged in other things. But what is it about your core campaign that they're not interested in? Yeah, exactly. Um, so a few questions about the download. I've just tested it and it seems to work. But uh, if if we get everybody's, if everyone's filled in the form, I'll make sure that we re-email everybody uh, the just good old fashioned attachment with the uh, with the spreadsheets. Yeah, we can make sure we do that subsequent to this event. So I think that's been a brilliant presentation, Alan, and really great to explore an area which I think is going to have more and more impact as we move forward to actually understand what's actually happening as a result of our communications and our outreach actions and then to take actions based on that and data is fundamental to that 